can stop the Lord Almighty? Who 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 can stop the Lord Almighty? so fitting for the song we just sang together and the song we're about to sing together. Starting in verse 1, it says, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. And then verse 8, come see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Let's continue to worship. This is what living looks like. This is what living looks like. 
God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. See things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our present, ever-present help in time of need. God, that your word says that you are always ready to help in times of trouble. That your word says that you are here with us, fully present with us, Lord. Lord, we just lean into you here this morning. 
We surrender to you and to your word, Lord. Have your way in us. Have your way in our hearts and do it only you can do, Lord. Soften us to your word this morning and to what you have to speak to us. We thank you, Lord, and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. feels like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. All God's people sing glory, glory, glory to God Almighty. What a sound. What a sound. And as we continue to express our gratitude, our thoughts, our, 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 our absolute wonder at God's good grace, we continue our worship this morning through our giving. You may have noticed as you walked through the doors in the foyer, there, there are offering plates back there. We welcome you to leave your gifts, your offerings uh, in the offering plates. We know that Jesus loves a cheerful giver. If you are, as Trent said earlier in the, in the day, we are, are, are getting more and more technologically advanced, and we have... Uh, Venmo available as well. If that's how you choose uh, to bring your offering to God, we, we welcome that as well. Uh, every Sunday, we love to worship in all the ways possible. We sing together, we give together, we pray together, and we also read scripture over each other. I've asked Gail this morning to come and read from the Psalms for us. If you are following each week, you know that just like the Psalm that that Holly read the, earlier today, these all tie into our message of the day. So Gail, I welcome you to come. The mic is turned on over here, I believe. I want you to hear scripture read over you before we go into prayer this morning. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach you. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Thank you, Gail. You are my hiding place. I know that throughout the week we have so many pressures, so many obstacles, so many distractions coming our way. And we often look to Sunday, to the Sabbath day, to take refuge in the mighty hand of our God. He is our hiding place. And this morning, I know that this is often the only time you get to seek that refuge, to quiet yourself, to quiet the world around you, and to come face to face with the living God. So I want to give you the next 60 seconds or so to quiet yourself, to bow your head, to close your eyes, and to come to that hiding place that is our Father above. So take these moments of silence, and then I will close us in prayer.
Heavenly Father, as you hear the worship, the praise, the confessions of your people, I know that this is what heaven sounds like. When all of your people bend the knee, they confess you as Lord, that they bring their fears, their transgressions, and they lay them at your feet. Lord, I, I know there are prayers this morning for comfort, for healing. Brought to you with fear and with heavy heart. Lord, I ask that you hear our prayers. Lord, I ask you hear our prayers and you strengthen our resolve, strengthen our faith in you. May we know your power. May we feel your love. May we feel the comfort of your hand of refuge around us. And Lord, as we look to your word this morning, I pray that you speak to each and every one of us. And if there be anything in me that stands in the way, Lord, please silence it, push it to the side. May your word be heard. May your will be done through us and for you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Walter. What a day the Lord has made. What a weekend the Lord has given us. I hope that everybody has had time to get out and enjoy that. Enjoy the springtime, enjoy the, the beautiful weather we've had. And as we continue our series in the Gospel of, according to John this morning... We enter a new section. We enter a section they call the Book of Signs. <laughs> this is when Jesus began his witness to the world. That is, his public ministry. Everything he would do from here on out would be very public. In front of everybody. Seen, argued, feared in many cases. And we'll be in this section for a while, for the, for, for the foreseeable coming weeks. We will be in this section all the way through the 12th chapter. And this book of signs, this, this, everything after the prelude through the 12th chapter, is really where you start to see all of the miracles. It's where you hear the preaching. And it's divided into a couple of sections itself. So we have the Cana cycle which is chapters 2 through 4, which actually begins and ends in Cana. And you'll see the water turned into wine. You'll see the healing of the royal official's son. You'll start to see those things in the Cana section. And then we'll get into the festival cycle, and that's chapters 5 through 11, in which the Jewish festivals help to define who Jesus is, how he's depicted as the fulfillment of prophecy, and how he's actually depicted as the fulfillment of the festivals themselves that the Jewish people were celebrating. But much more on that later as, as we continue to study John's gospel. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, though, let's recall that John has just introduced Jesus in the prologue in a much different way than the writers of the synoptic gospels. Rather than beginning with the genealogy or the baptism of, of Jesus, John goes all the way to creation itself. He knows the skepticism that he might face, but he explains there how Jesus is the creative word of God. He's not, as some would have us believe, just a prophet or just a teacher or just a preacher that were on the street corners. No, according to John, 
himself. Jesus is God himself. John wrote this later in life, so of course he knew Jesus was God. But all the way back to the beginning, in the middle of, of chapter 1, you see that John the Baptist also knew that. He knew that Jesus was the Son of God. He baptized Jesus. And in one of the few places in Scripture, we see the Trinity at the same place at the same time. It spoke to John the Baptist. And therefore, he introduces Jesus in a way that commanded action. So let's pick up the story here in the first chapter. At the end, we will we'll actually be reading from the Pew Bibles from page 1054, beginning in chapter 1, verse 35. Stand with me in honor of God's word. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him for that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we see you and we're forced into action. We're forced to make a decision. Like John the Baptist said so long ago, behold the Lamb of God. And we're forced with that moment now. May our decisions be your will, Lord. May we see, may we hear, and may we follow. In Jesus' name, amen. So first, we see Jesus walking, just minding his own business, walking by. And John the Baptist makes a comment <laughs> that had to come out of nowhere to those who would hear it as well. Behold, the Lamb of God. When's the last time you heard somebody introduced like that? So like I said before, this is not the same introduction that the other Gospels gave to Christ. Jesus first appears in the, to the disciples in John almost mysteriously. It's just a man walking by, 
the side of the scene, so to speak. We're not introduced to his childhood. We're not introduced to his teaching. We're not introduced to the tempting or from the voice of heaven. John knows we've already read that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In the other Gospels, John had taught, he had preached, or excuse me, Jesus had taught, he had preached, and he called people to them. But in this case, we're not in, we don't see that yet. We see the firsthand account of John, who was standing listening to John the Baptist, and got the introduction firsthand. It was a pointing finger. It was a turn of the attention. Look, behold, the Lamb of God. And it's in that moment that the call to action begins. The disciples, in fact, are the first ones here to take the initiative. So first we see that the disciples take initiative. They answer a calling that exists in the introduction to Jesus Christ immediately. Because what we know is that you cannot look on the Lamb of God himself and not take action. Now, the action you decide to take is yours, of course. But it's not like, hey, look, there's a man walking with the Lamb. There's a man going about his business. This is not a scrolling moment in our day where we see people hear things and just pass them by without a second thought. No. This is the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the one whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote as John and Andrew would know so intimately in that moment what was just stated, what was just happening so immediately they have a decision to make, and they take initiative to follow him. No word said at this moment. As a matter of fact, Jesus, the first words he says to them are, what do you want? Such a straightforward, almost innocent question. But in the what do you want to two men who turn and just walk away from everything to follow him, he's starting to understand what are their purposes? What are their goals? What are their hearts? Perhaps they said, we heard you were the one that would come and free us from Rome. You would be the mighty warrior. He's already starting to understand their hearts. What do you want? A simple yet amazing question. And then his next statement is so simple, but again, it invites that action. Come and see. Come and see. It's interesting that come is often the command that Jesus gives. We hear come and see, hear verse 39. Later we'll hear come and drink. Still later yet, we'll hear Come and dine. Come is a great invitation of God's grace. And it would be used then with Philip to Nathaniel as well. Thus imitating the command that we have. Using that same approach. Come and see. So the disciples take the first initiative. They take the first risk and they go. But notice that as they come, they also go. We see that Andrew comes and then he goes to get Simon. So this idea of come and go is already established with the first story of calling the disciples. And it pays off for Simon too, doesn't it? Because immediately, as soon as Simon approached, what does Jesus do? He takes absolute control of Simon. He takes ownership of him. How do I say he takes ownership of him? He renames him. Now, I can look across and I can see your names. And I can guess where your names came from. 
and I can guess the authority and the control of the person who gave you that name. Can you imagine being an established man walking the earth in your own way and getting renamed immediately upon seeing the Christ? But isn't that what he does with us too? The details of Jesus' ministry we become really familiar with. And they'll all eventually be explained by John as we continue to work through this. But here, I'm struck by the fact that we see Jesus almost in silence. So subtle and yet so powerful right from the very beginning. How do I know they're subtle and powerful? Because here you have men seeing, taking initiative, accepting new names right from the very beginning, just nothing but a complete willingness to follow right from the beginning. Now we say these are men, but we know from the stories that we've read over the years that they were still pretty immature, weren't they? They came almost in ignorance as much as naivety. But you notice their lives changed immediately with the power of the Lamb of God standing in front of them. So the crucial issue really in discipleship when we think about our own walk with God, with our own initiative to follow God, we see that the crucial issue in discipleship is not whether we're mature at the beginning, not whether we know all the answers at the beginning, but whether or not we have a desire to leave everything behind, to come and to see what this man is all about. Do we take initiative? And then do we abide in that divine presence? Do we know from the very moment that we are stepping into something that will change our lives forever? So while we saw the, the initiative taken by the disciples, next we see Jesus respond immediately. He is faithful to respond immediately to that decision. And in the next section then here in verse 43, it begins with the calling of Philip. Whereas Andrew went and found Simon, Jesus now finds Philip in verse 43. But just like Andrew coming and going, we see Philip do the same thing. Disobedience to come and then go is seen with Philip because he goes and tells in verse 45, Nathaniel. So right away we see the, the fact that this sharing, this invitation to go and tell somebody what has happened is sewn right into the very fabric of being a disciple from the beginning. The first action of Philip is to go and tell. Now, I love Nathaniel's answer. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? How many times have you said that? Of course, replace Nazareth with the city that only you know in your mind right now. Can anything good come out of that place? What we see in Nathaniel is what has become known as the Nazareth Principle. He has reason to question whether or not Jesus is the one promised. But he puts it into his own context, doesn't he? Can something really good come out of there? Not knowing exactly the birth story, he makes assumptions based on the context of the world around him. How many times do we do that ourselves? We look around and we see the tr trouble, the turmoil happening there or happening there, and we say, can anything good come out of that? Dismissing before the conversation even takes place between God, us and God, what he's doing there. But with Nathaniel, unlike the others, unlike the other 
Jewish Pharisees, unlike a lot of the Roman citizens, a lot of the people that couldn't get past their stereotypes and biases. He was open to the possibility that Jesus just might be above the place where he came from. He might be above the place where he walks now. And what, we, what do we hear from Nathaniel? We see Jesus take initiative. He answers Nathaniel right away. He looks deep into Nathaniel's heart, and I love it in verse 47 and 48. And when Jesus revealed his knowledge of Nathaniel, where he had been, what he had been doing, it was enough to convince Nathaniel that, oh my goodness, you must be the king of Israel. You must be the son of God. He saw firsthand that which only God would know. His experience was a lot like the woman at the well. And we'll get to her story a little bit later. But what did the woman at the well do? She left and she said, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? So while Nathaniel asks, can anything good come out of Nazareth? We see the woman at the well meet Jesus and say, can this be the Christ where I would go to draw water? And you see how Jesus looks right into the soul, penetrates their understanding, penetrates their biases, their, their resistance, and breaks that down to the point where they say, you are the Son of God. We see just how quickly Jesus reveals their heart. We see just how quickly Jesus can see us. Jesus can know us. And just how quickly Jesus calls us, despite the sins, the transgressions that Gail was reading about in the Psalms, we can lay them at his feet, and he calls us immediately into that obedience. By the way, the revealing of the human heart is also something that should take place in ministry today. The local church today has the opportunity to see, to follow in obedience, and then to go. Look into the hearts of our friends and neighbors and say, come and see. Come and see the God of Israel. Come and see the Son of God. Come and see the man who knows all about me, knows all about you, and chooses to be in relationship with you anyway chooses to redeem you despite your past. Opponents will question, whereas Nathaniel would wholeheartedly confess and accept despite the biases of the context of the world around them. So while Jesus was introduced as one who comes on the scene, moves silently past the gathering man is and then shown as one who does amazing work with very few words as he acknowledges, as he sees with authority those coming for him. He concludes this section then by making an amazing claim, by making a promise. We see in verse 151, he said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open. And the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, who's Jesus speaking to here? Quite frankly, he's standing face to face with Nathaniel. But he's saying you in the plural here. So this is intended for the rest of the disciples standing nearby as well. Jesus did this all the time. He would speak face to face with one, but to them all in what he wanted to communicate. The allusion is clearly here to Jacob's ladder. He knows that Nathaniel and the disciples would know their scripture. They would know Genesis, the story in Genesis, where it says Genesis 8 or 28, 12, 
And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Jesus knows, talking to Nathanael, that in his promise, Nathanael would immediately see the reference to Jacob's ladder. He would see the reference to the ladder, but he would see the Son of God standing in front of him. This is the fulfillment of Scripture. So Jacob's ladder, Israel's ladder, is now standing face to face with Nathaniel and the disciples. He is the ladder to heaven. He is the king of Israel. So you have Nathaniel, the true Israelite, as Jesus calls him, responding to God, to Jesus, the Son of God, the King of Israel, and the promise that's made. Now we know that Nathaniel would see the story, but I wonder if we understand the promise that's made as well. Do we understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of the stories of Genesis, the stories of John, and the stories of today? Do we understand that Jesus works through the context of our surroundings, through the understanding of what we might be walking through to present himself as the Lamb of God? Do we understand that heaven has indeed opened and we have no need to ascend because God has come to us. If you get nothing from John 1 other than the very baseline that Jesus is God himself come to us, you're on the right path. We will have time as we work through John to work out the details, but it begins here that Jesus, not a ladder, not a story, is the focal point of God's revelation. He is the focal point of who God is and what he's doing here on earth. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that while others were questioning, Nathaniel wholeheartedly accepts and confesses. He knows that Jesus is the Son of God, the King of Israel. And he reveals himself to Nathaniel and the others first. So for those of you keeping track, how many believe at this point? We have six. We have John the Baptist, John who's writing the story, Andrew, Simon, who's renamed Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. Now they hadn't forsaken all. We haven't gotten all the details of everything in them following, but they have taken the first step. They've taken that first experience of his power and they've made a decision. They've come face to face with the Lamb of God. And they know now that in the years that lie ahead, they will be following their teacher, their rabbi, their God. And in doing so, they will grow in their faith. They will learn more about this man who comes from Nazareth. They will understand that Jesus is God in the flesh. And one day they understand that they will take his place as those disciples to go and tell, to ask others to come and see, to understand that just like Jacob's ladder, God has come to us. He has So the witness of this entire chapter is really clear. Jesus has come. So this is where you come in. I think about when I first heard this story. And I, I'll admit to you, it sounded far off, far away, long, long time ago. And now as I mature, I realize that as kids, we often hear that 
in a place long ago and far away. And we hear the beginnings of a story, of a fairy tale, don't we? We think long ago, far away, and our mind goes elsewhere. But when I stand here this morning and I repeat the words of John the Baptist, and I say, behold, the Lamb of God, Jesus has come to you now. This isn't long ago. This isn't far away. This is here and now. And the question comes to you. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good take away the pain of our world? Can anything good cure that which ails us? Come and see. Come and see the man who knows all about us and redeems us anyway. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are surrounded by all the bad things that come out of bad places. May they be the Middle East, Maybe they be the, the town we have in our minds right now where we doubt anything good can come of this. But in laying eyes on you and hearing your invitation, we now come to this moment to take our own action, to take our own initiative, to see that you are the Son of God, the King of Israel, and the Israel that we are as the church of God is under your divine providence, is under your divine hand. So Lord, I pray that if anybody here has heard that invitation for the first time to come and see, that you'll remove the cloud from their eyes, that you'll remove the, the stuffing from their ears and they will hear that you have come. And they will take that step of obedience to follow, to go and to tell others. And for those of us who have made that step, Lord, I pray that we hear you loud and clear today. That we will look into the hearts of our friends and our neighbors. We will implore them to come and see he who takes away the sins of the world. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, oh come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgive was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come. Oh, come to the altar. The 
Here be. 